Nope. Cats don't drink tea. Good evening, peoples. I'm Pastor Leia, and this, of course, is my friend Ginger Schnapp. Uh, and tonight, in our continuing series on the deuterocanonical or apocryphal books of the Bible, uh, we get to tell a very, very fun story, the story of Judith, depicted here on one of my favorite teacups. Cats don't drink tea. Stop trying to get your whiskers into it. Cats. So, uh, the deuterocanonical or uh, second canon books are found in Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, but not Protestant ones, unless they happen to be giant, super thick study Bibles, such as this one, which have the extra stories and also a bajillion notes, which is great. Um, so uh, they are the second set of stories. Um, of course, there's the books that all of us have in our Bibles because they're you know pretty well established. And then there's the second category that's only in some of them. So uh, deuterocanonical, second canon. So the, the story of Judith is a kind of interesting backstory. We don't know what language it was originally written in. Like the oldest copy we have is in Hebrew, but like grammatically, it sounds more Greek, if that makes sense. I don't know. Any, anyway, um, it can be regarded as the uh, first work of historical fiction, which is quite interesting. So uh, yeah, we, we had uh, the first uh, detective story, the first like a uh, closed room murder mystery uh, in these deuterocanonical books uh, and stories. Anyway, it's just, this is a really fun, excellent, great story that I'm very excited to be sharing with props. We'll get there. So. Ginger Snap, you do make it very difficult to have a Bible open if you insist on sitting upright on my lap. You could be on the electric blanket. You could be on the... No? Okay, we don't want to do that. So, the uh, Book of Judith. So there's uh, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, um, and basically he's a bad guy. Uh, so he, you know, keeps fighting against all these different countries and he's like hey you uh you want to like be my ally no hmm, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna conquer you then so so yeah too bad um so he uh goes to war against a bunch of kingdoms ginger snap seriously so he's been king for uh, let's see 18 years now um and so his general holofernes is ginger snap let me let me tell the story please uh, his general, Holofernes, is going to be one of our main characters. So Holofernes, you might want to remember that name. So uh, they conquer more people. Here's a whole bunch of Hebrew names uh, and also descriptions of Ginger Snap. Uh, how much uh, wealth and power these people have. Uh, some people want to have peace. He's like, mm, or I could just defeat you in battle. I'm going to do that instead. Uh, did, did I mention that the, this, this guy is kind of a jerk? Um, anyway, so um, now the Israelites living in Judea heard of everything that Holofernes, the general of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Assyrians, had done to the nations and how he had plundered and destroyed all their temples. They were therefore greatly terrified at his approach. They were alarmed both for Jerusalem and for the temple of the Lord their God. They had only recently returned from exile and all the people of Judea had just now gathered together, and the sacred vessels and the altar and the temple have been consecrated after their profanation. Uh, so they are getting a bit nervous because General Holofernes is coming near. Uh, so of course they pray, they fast, they put ashes on their heads and uh, wear sackcloth as you do. Um, so now they're trying to figure out what they can do against this uh, rather imminent threat. Um, so meanwhile, uh, Holofernes, as he's getting near to, the, to these to the um, Israelites, like, hmm. so tell me, tell me about the, these people, an advisor person who's like my local expert. And so um, he is told a whole uh, history of the Israelites and uh, their time in exile and uh, in the wilderness and all the all these adventures. And so. Um, when he had finished saying these things, all the people standing around the tent began to complain. Holofernes' officers and all the inhabitants of the seacoast and Moab insisted that he should be cut to pieces. They said, We are not afraid of the Israelites. They are a people with no strength or power for making war. Therefore, let us go ahead, Lord Holofernes, and your vast army will swallow them up. 
which is a new way to treat people or regard people. And anyway, um, yeah, so uh, the, the guy is back uh, to Israelites. Uh, so now we have uh, the campaign against Bethulia, which is um, the place name that there's no record of this place existing anywhere else in any historical or literary record. Again, this is historical fiction, so it's a imaginary place. Um, so, uh, the next day, Holofernes ordered his whole army and all the allies who had joined him to break camp and move against Bethulia, and to seize the passes up into the hill country and make war on the Israelites. So they do that. Uh, when the Israelites saw their vast numbers, they were greatly terrified and said to one another, they will now strip clean the whole land. Neither the high mountains, nor the valleys, nor the hills will bear their weight. Yet they all seized their weapons, and when they had kindled fires on their towers, they remained on guard all that night. So now, Ginger Snap, you could be on the electric blanket and you would be making this a whole lot easier for me. But cats are not interested in making things easier for people. Of course they're not. Um, okay, so now um, they are right outside Bethulia and they have uh, taken control of the water source. So now the people of the city of Bethulia cannot go and get water. So they are under siege. Without water is not a good time. Uh, so the Israelites then cried out to the Lord their God for their courage failed because all their enemies had surrounded them, and there was no way of escape from them. The whole Assyrian army, their infantry, chariots, and cavalry, surrounded them for 34 days, until all the water containers of every inhabitant of Bethulia were empty. Their cisterns were going dry, and on no day did they have enough water to drink, for their drinking water was rationed. Their children were listless, and the women and young men fainted from thirst, and were collapsing in the streets of the town and in the gateways. They no longer had any strength. So they're like, uh, should, should, we, should, should we just surrender? Because, like, we're going to literally die of thirst if we don't. Would it be better to surrender and maybe be sold as slaves or something? Or should we just die? Or There, there is no good option here. Um, so, the priest says, Courage, my brothers and sisters, let us hold out for five days more. By that time, the Lord our God will turn uh, mercy to us again and will not forsake us utterly. But if these days go by and no help comes for us, I will do as you say and surrender. Um, so, now, eight chapters in, we are finally introduced to the titular character of Judith, who is just such a great character, so excited. Um, now, in these days, Judith heard about these things. Uh, well, of course she heard of these things. She was literally living them. That's an odd way to introduce her, but that is neither here nor there. Uh, she was the daughter of your whole family tree with a bunch of long Hebrew names. Um, anyway, she is a uh, beautiful young widow. So, um, see, she's been a widow for uh, three years and change. Um, so she put sackcloth around her waist and dressed in widow's clothing, so she also is uh, fasting along with um, everyone else in the city. Uh, kind of forced fasting, but also spiritual fasting. Uh, they don't really have options. Uh, so no one spoke ill of her, for she feared God with great devotion, and uh, she's described as beautiful, and her husband left her with a bunch of money, so she's rich and beautiful, young widow who's very faithful. So, when Judith heard the harsh words spoken by the people against the ruler, because they were faint for lack of water, and when she heard all that the priest had said to them, and how he promised them under oath to surrender the town to the Assyrians after five days, she sent her maid, who was in charge of all she possessed, to summon uh, the priests and the elders. They came to her, and she said to them, like, guys, what, what, you're, you're, you're putting God to the test? Like, saying, you know, if, if God doesn't help us in five days, then, like, God has, you, you can't, like, test God like that. You either have faith or you don't. Um, but, like, that, that's really not, not the way to be approaching faith. Um, because otherwise, you're kind of saying that if God does not uh, deliver us, then God is powerless, and that's, that's, that's not great. The priest is like, I mean, yeah, but we're, we're kind of in a bad place here, Judith. Which, 
I mean, to be fair, he, he's not exactly wrong. There's not really any good options here. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, Judith says, okay, I am about to do something that will go down through all generations of our descendants. Stand at the town gate tonight, so that I may go out with my maid, and within the days after which you have promised to surrender the town to our enemies, the Lord will deliver Israel by my hand. Only do not try to find out what I am doing, for I will not tell you until I have finished what I am about to do. So the priest and the ruler said to her, Go in peace, and may the Lord God go before you to take vengeance on our enemies. So they returned from their tent and went to their posts. So she has this plan. She's not telling them what it is. But she is saying, God will deliver us by my hand. You aren't doing anything, but I'm going to. Uh, so then she prays for uh, about a page and a half. Uh, Let your whole nation and every tribe know and understand that you are God, the God of all power and might, and that there is no other who protects the people of Israel but you alone. Uh, so now uh, she is ready to go out, so she calls her maid. Uh, she takes off uh, the sackcloth and, and ashes and puts herself in some nice clothes, uh, sandals, and puts on a bunch of jewelry. Um, so she gives her maid a skin of wine and a flask of oil and filled a bag with roasted grain, dried fig cakes, and fine bread. Then she wrapped up all her dishes and gave them to her to carry. Uh, so then she goes out, and uh, so the uh, priest, etc., say, May the God of our ancestors grant you favor and fulfill your plans, so that the people of Israel may glory and Jerusalem may be exalted. She bowed down to God. So, yeah, good luck. Um, so, uh, yeah, so she is going out accompanied by her maid. The men of the town watched her until she had gone down the mountain and passed through the valley where they lost sight of her. So as the women were going straight on through the valley, an Assyrian patrol met her and took her into custody. They asked her, to what people do you belong and where are you coming from and where are you going? She replied, I am a daughter of the Hebrews, but I am fleeing from them for they are about to be handed over to you to be devoured. I am on my way to see Holofernes, the commander of your army, to give him a true report. I will show him a way by which he can go and capture all the hill country without losing one of his men captured or slain." So she is saying that she is going to betray her people uh, because she sees the writing on the wall. Clearly the city is going to get conquered and she would like to not be part of that, please. Uh, so she's going to go to Holofernes and uh, kind of tell him uh, how to better get into the city uh, in exchange for um, her, her life and freedom, is, is what she is saying. What she is saying. Um, so all these men are like, oh wow, you're really pretty. Uh, are, are all of your people like that? Maybe we should reconsider if, if uh, your people are as pretty as you. Um, spoiler alert, humans have inherent worth whether or not they're pretty, and that's really not a good reason to kill or not kill. I mean, don't, don't kill people regardless, but anyway, smash the patriarchy. Uh, so then the guards of Holofernes and all his servants came out and led Judith into the tent. Holofernes was resting on his bed under a canopy that was woven with purple and gold, emeralds, and other precious stones. You know, you got to travel with your bling. Why not? Um, and they all marveled at her beauty again. Her, her beauty is mentioned quite, quite, quite a few times in, in this book. Um, so Holofernes says, Take courage, woman, and do not be afraid in your heart, for I have never hurt anyone who chose to serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of all the earth. Even now, if your people who live in the hill country had not slighted me, I would never have lifted my spear against them. Yeah, I'm only about to kill them because they annoyed me. That's a perfectly reasonable response. Uh, so again, Judith says, um, accept me. Um, I won't lie to you. That in itself a little bit of a lie. Um, anyway, so she has this, this whole story about um, uh, the food supply is, is exhausted. Um, death will fall upon them. Uh, she uh, 
knows that uh, they kind of d deserve to be conquered because of sin or something. Uh, so she has this whole thing and she's really just laying on the flattery of this guy. Like, I, I know that you were just so strong and powerful that like it won't even be effort for you to, to conquer Bethulia because you're just so strong and powerful and oh my gosh, the emerald sewn into your tent because why not? Um, Kind of seems like a weird thing to sew into a can. Not the point. Uh, but you're you're just you're just so so strong and cool and amazing. And he's like, yeah yeah yeah. Keep, keep talking. I'm I'm enjoying all these compliments. Um. So uh, let's see. So then uh, he wants to offer her some uh, food and wine. Uh, but she says, uh, I cannot partake of them, or it will be an offense uh, because of her religion, you know, she keeps kosher, etc. Uh, but I, I have enough with me, I brought some food. Um, so uh, he says to her, if your supply runs out, where can we get you more of the same? For none of your people are here with us. Judith replied, as surely as you live, my lord, your servant will not use up the supplies I have with me before the Lord carries out by my hand what God has determined. Boy, is that foreshadowing. Um, which kind of seems like a very uh, ominous thing to say, and he doesn't have a response to this, which, okay. Um, so, yeah, so she's uh, now camping out with them. Uh, so now on the fourth day, Holofernes has a big banquet and uh, invites her to join them. Uh, let this pretty girl not hesitate to come to my lord to be honored in his presence, because again, we really have to stress that Judith is beautiful. Uh, she's also a great strategist, but I mean, why would that need to be repeated over and over? Uh, so she says, oh, who am I to refuse my lord? Uh, whatever pleases him, I will do at once, and it will be a joy to me until the day of my death. Uh, and so she puts on her uh, finest clothes and goes to join him, and uh, Holofernes uh, just struck again with how beautiful she is. So Holofernes said to her, have a drink and be merry with us. Judith said, I will gladly drink, my lord, because today is the greatest day in my whole life. Then she took what her maid had prepared and ate and drank before him. Holofernes was greatly pleased with her and drank a great quantity of wine, much more than he had ever drunk in any one day since he was born. So he is super, super drunk. Uh, when evening came, his slaves quickly withdrew. Um, the tent is closed from the outside, uh, so they went to bed, for they were all weary because the banquet had lasted so long. There. But Judith was left alone in the tent, with Holofernes stretched out on his bed, for he was dead drunk. Now Judith had told her maid to stand outside the bedchamber, and to wait for her to come out, as she did on the other days, for she said she would be going out for her prayers. So as she had said the same thing uh, to the servant guy, so everyone went out and no one, either small or great, was left in the bedchamber. So it's just Judith and a very drunk, passed out Holofernes. Then Judith standing beside his bed said in her heart, O Lord God of all might, look in this hour on the work of my hands for the exaltation of Jerusalem. Now indeed is the time to help your heritage and to carry out my design to destroy the enemies who have risen up against us. So she went up to the bedpost near Holofernes' head and took down his sword that was hung there. She came close to his bed, took hold of the hair of his head and said, give me strength today, O Lord God of Israel. Then she struck his neck twice with all her might and cut off his head. Next, she rolled his body off the bed and pulled down the canopy from the posts. Soon afterward, she went out and gave Holofernes head to her maid, who placed it in her food bag. And this is actually the head of John the Baptist that I made a few years ago for a costume, but I mean, if you're gonna have a severed head lying around your house, you might as well have John the Baptist uh, play the role of Holofernes for a video. One of my favorite Halloween decorations. So, uh, her maid now has a severed head in her food bag. 
which I hope she never puts food in it again because that was uh, a severed head in her food bag. So now the two of them went out together as they were accustomed to do for prayer. They passed through the camp, circled around the valley, and went up the mountain to Bethulia and came to its gates. So uh, they've kind of um, implied to people that uh, for their you know, religious practice, they need to uh, be you know, a little bit out of sight because they're just going to pray, but then they'll be right back. And so on the fourth night of this, uh, Holly Furness's guys are like, oh yeah, they'll be back in a bit, it's cool. Um, but they slip out of sight and sneak away back to the city with, again, a severed head in a food bag and uh, also um, the, the canopy that was sewn in with emeralds and golds and all that. Uh, so, from a distance, Judith called out to the sentries at the gates, Open, open the gate! God, our God, is with us, still showing power in Israel and strength against our enemies, as God has done today. When the people of her town heard her voice, they hurried down to the town gate and summoned the elders of the town. They all ran together, both small and great, for it seemed unbelievable that she had returned. They opened the gate and welcomed them. Then they lit fire to give light and gathered around them. And she said to them with a loud voice, Praise God, oh praise God, praise God, who has not withdrawn mercy from the house of Israel, but has destroyed our enemies by my hand this very night. Then she pulled the head out of the bag and showed it to them and said, See here, the head of Holofernes, the commander of the Assyrian army, and here is the canopy beneath which he lay in his drunken stupor. The Lord has struck him down by the hand of a woman. As the Lord lives, who has protected me in the way I went, I swear that it was my face that seduced him to his destruction and that he committed no sin with me to defile and shame me. I just got him super drunk and cut off his head, as you do. Uh, so they're like, you, I, I mean, like, we, we, you said you had a plan, but we weren't expecting this, but yay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, may God uh, reward you, perpetual honor. Uh, anyway, so now uh, they take the head and they, hang it outside the city gates, as you do. Um, and so now uh, they are going to go to the camp of Holofernes uh, because everyone's super hungover after this giant banquet party last night. So, uh, you know. Um, the, and also their, their general is uh, missing his head and they haven't noticed this yet because they're all pretty hungover. Uh, so they do that. Thank you, Ginger Snap. Uh, so you do that. So now uh, Holofernes' death is uh, discovered, what with, you know, his head being hung from a wall. Um, anyway, they're like, oh, and the Assyrians flee in panic, as, as you do, uh, which, I mean, kind of fair. Um, so now the Israelites celebrate. Judith offers a, a long hymn of praise. Um, they arrive at Jerusalem. They worship God. Uh, they, they make offerings. Um, Judith also dedicated to God all the possessions of Holofernes, which the people had given her, and the canopy that she had taken for herself from his bedchamber, she gave as a votive offering. Um, so then, basically, they all live happily ever after. Uh, Judith never marries again, uh, and she ends up dying at the age of 105, which is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, so uh, this is such a great story. Uh, it's a little uh, similar uh, to the story of Yael, who doesn't um, behead anyone, but she uh, hammers a tent spike through the head of Sisera, the uh, enemy general. Um, so uh, th these stories are kind of often um, c compared to each other because they are quite quite similar. Uh, su such, such a great story. Uh, Judith is a very uh, strong female character, for sure. Um, so this is historical fiction, but it's just a really satisfying story to tell. Uh, good very much wins the day against uh, pretty difficult odds. Um, and it's just, there's so much art of um, this, this story. Uh, this is uh, just one uh, painting by uh, Gustav Klimt, uh, 1901, I think it was. So beautiful woman holding uh, a severed head down here in the corner. Um, the, the plate kind of really cuts it off and doesn't really show too much on the teacup either. I feel like I, it's 
an odd thing to cut out for, for scale. I mean, anyway, because uh, obviously everyone wants a, a severed head on their teacup. Um, or maybe that's just me. This is my uh, first uh, Holy Week present to myself in my first year here. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is also a story that's uh, popularly told uh, around Hanukkah, which is interesting. Um, and so because um, kind of the story gets built up around it, one of the reasons that Holofernes gets so drunk is because Judith keeps feeding him salty cheese. So he keeps like drinking wine because he's thirsty from the salty cheese. Um, so like cheesy dairy dishes are uh, often uh, traditional at Hanukkah for that reason, which is so delightful. Um, yeah, so um, I, I do recognize that this is a um, violent story, to put it mildly. I mean, severed head. Um, and uh, it's not exactly the sort of a happy bedtime story that we might necessarily tell today because of all the violence and bloodshed. Um, and the story of Yael kind of gets this reaction too. And uh, it was definitely met with some kind of a mixed feelings when I shared the story of Yael a few years ago, because it's a great story. Um, we would really prefer that the happy ending not be that a woman kills a guy in cold blood. Um, but nevertheless, they are heroes. Yael is uh, called most blessed of women in the Bible. Uh, and Judith also is a great hero um, in the traditions that share this story. Um, but I, it, no one has an issue with the story of David and Goliath, even though David, who is a kid, murders a guy and cuts off his head with his own sword, which is exactly what Judith does to Holofernes. And it just seems incredibly hypocritical that people are completely okay with that story, but weirded out and uncomfortable with the story of Judith. Uh, patriarchy, sexism, etc., 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 probably has a, a lot to do with that. Um, but the different ways that those stories are seen is very odd and interesting. But if we're going to celebrate David as a hero for killing an enemy soldier, cutting off his head, and presenting that head as a trophy, then we should also celebrate Judith for killing an, an enemy uh, officer, uh, cutting off his head with his own sword, and presenting his head as a trophy, uh, because they both, you know, save the day by, by doing that, even though it's uh, very um, bloody and unfortunate. If you have to kill somebody to, you know, get the, the good solution, I mean, that, it's never good to have to kill people. Um, there, there is something to be said for, uh, in each case, they only killed uh, one person and the battle or the war was over and done. So I guess you could argue that that saved some lives. Um, whatever. Anyway, so uh, Judith is just such a great story. I genuinely wish that this were um, in our Bible because it's just such a great story. Um, and there's just uh, so many narratives of the Israelites uh, being in exile, being in the wilderness, uh, being um, mistreated, being under the rule of people uh, who are not kind to them. But this is a story that has a happy ending and uh, is just empowering and great. And um, as far as uh, spiritual sustenance from the story, um, well, I mean, don't put God to the test is a pretty good moral. Um, uh, yeah, you know, God will, God will deliver the people, uh, even uh, by very unexpected means sometimes. Uh, so anyway, I'm very excited to have been able to, to share this story with uh, props and, and, and such. Uh, it is uh, Halloween, so it you know, seems extra appropriate to have, you know, severed head uh, out of the, my, my closet, as, as you do. Uh, so speaking of Halloween, uh, you are encouraged to wear non-scary costumes to church on Sunday, if you uh, would like to be doing that. I definitely will be in a full costume. Uh, we're doing the, the Daughters of Zalofahad this year, so you should, you should come for that. Another great story, um, which definitely is in the Bible. Um, so uh, Halloween is on a Sunday this year, so um, we usually have our uh, canopy on the corner um, from six to eight, the hours of trick-or-treating uh, here in Milan. So we give out uh, cookies. Um, in, in other non-COVID years, uh, we give out hot cider too. Uh, we're, not, we're not doing that this year. So if you um, 
have some time uh, Sunday evening, you are welcome to come join us for that. Um, if you're more like out in the country, don't get trick-or-treaters, want to see the cute kids in their costumes, which is always fun, um, you might bring uh, treats with you in your car and we can have a trunk or treat in the parking lot since a lot of kids do come through uh, this, this neighborhood for sure and uh, great you know, costume watching um, fun. So uh, until then, happy Halloween. Uh, Ginger Schnapp seems to have abandoned me, maybe to go and get more food. I don't know where she went. Uh, maybe uh, she, she finally got annoyed with how much I had to keep moving the Bible over her to be able to read it. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, good night until then. Happy Halloween, and I hope some of you will join me in costume on Sunday.